Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on our time zone. I'm Pascual Paliuso, faculty member and currently director of the Fisk Institute at Campina State University in Brazil. I also co-chair of the SCAS 2020 conference. As you know, SCAS 2020 was postponed due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and the SCAS webinar series is organized to keep your community connected and live during the absence of the in-person SCAS conference. The new dates for the SCAS 2020, year 21, are September 27 to October 2nd, 2021. The SCAS 2020 year 21 conference will be either fully online or in a hybrid format with some in-person activity if the sanitary conditions allow. The SCAS 2010 year 21 abstract subinitio is open, so please check the conference website to sub submit your abstract and check for updates. Now I would like to welcome all of you to today's West SCAS webinar. Thank you very much for joining us for this event, and I hope you and your family are well and healthy during this difficult time. The participants are welcome to ask questions after the talks. The participants in the Zoom meeting can ask questions using the raise hand feature, while participants in the Facebook can use the chat to ask questions. During the presentation, please keep your microphones muted and your videos off, but we are welcome to start our videos and unmute your microphones to ask questions. So to introduce our speakers for today, I would like to invite Professor Julian Sereni from the Centro Atomico de Bariloche, Argentina. Professor Seren is a very well-known member of this community and a member of the SCAS 2020 International Advisory Committee. Professor Seren, thanks for being with us today and please, you may begin the introduction of our speakers. Good morning, everybody. Uh, nice to, to share with you this, uh, this meeting. Uh, I just will really introduce uh, the first speaker that this, in this uh, parallel session will be held by Janina Passano. She got her PhD degree in 2003 at the Instituto Balseiro de Bariloche in Argentina. Afterward, she made a long postdoctoral stay as teaching assistant at the University of Geneva. She's currently permanent researcher of the Argentinian National Council for Science and Technology at the Low Temperature Laboratory of the Centro Atomico in Bariloche. She leads a research line on local electronic and magnetic properties of superconductors and strongly correlated electron systems. Her area of interest is focused in vortex matter in superconductors as a model system of soft condensed matter. She uses scanning tunnel spectroscopy to unveil local electronic order in those materials. The title of her presentation is uh, Non-Gaussian Tail in the Force Distribution as a Hallmark of Correlated Disorder in the Host Media of Elastic Objects. So Janina, it's your turn. Uh, so uh, thank you to the organizers of the conference for giving me the possibility uh, to give this invited parallel session talk. Today we talk to you about uh, the detection of non-Gaussian tails in the force distribution of interacting elastic objects and how we uh, propose this as a method to discern uh, when correlated disorder is present in the host media of, uh, of the, where the elastic objects are located. I work, as Julian said, at the Low Temperature Lab and this work uh, is the work of many of my current students that you can see here in the picture. Jasmine, Joaquin, and Gonzalo. And as you can see now, we have to have our these physical discussions in open air in the mountains. So, um, and former students, uh, René uh, Cejas Bolechez and Raul Cortez Maldonado. So I also perform this work in collaboration with colleagues in the low temperature lab uh, with uh, Kies van der Beek and Martin Konchikowski from France and the theoretical uh, collaboration discussions was done with Alejandro Colton of the Solid State Theory Group of Bariloche. So, I hope I can go down. Okay, so uh, which is the motivation for doing this study? Well, normally, 
uh, when you nucleate uh, elastic objects in the media, the nature of disorder in the, in the media affects a lot of physical properties. And one nice example is uh, the critical current in uh, high temperature superconductors. If you have, for instance, correlated disorder like uh, columnar defects generated by heavy ion and radiation, so if you have tracks of defects, that will increase the critical current of the system. And so that will enhance the range of application of, of, of these uh, materials for, for, uh, for, for, uh, for application, let's say. So the critical current is enhanced when the pinning is correlated, when the disorder is correlated, compared uh, to the case where the disorder is point-like. So what, here, what we do is to propose a non-invasive method that will allow us to distinguish when do we have point-like or correlated disorder in the system. Normally, this, uh, the way to, to know this is to, to perform kind of uh, invasive or even sample destructive uh, procedures like TEM. But uh, uh, what we will present here is a method to uh, do it without uh, distracting, uh, without being destructive. Serena, I guess we lost yes. Janina, unfortunately. Maybe, maybe we should we should move to Isabel while Janina try to improve her connection. What do you think? Uh, yes, uh, we try to, to get some connection with her by phone. Mm. Yeah, but meanwhile, maybe we can, we can switch and yes. have Isabel yes. start okay. first. Isabel, are you yes. there? Yes, thank you. Okay. So, Julian could please make introduction of Isabel and then we try to, to establish the connection with Yanina. Of meanwhile. course. Yes, of course. So we keep uh, calling this the second talk uh, of this meeting by Isabel Piviamon. Uh, Isabel got uh, her PhD degree in 2009 at the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, having a postdoctoral stay at the University of Bristol. She is currently Ramon y Cajal researcher at the Condensed Matter Physics Department of Nicolás Cabrera Institute. Within the starting grant project, NICTIRES, supported by the European Research Consign, she, she performs uh, tandem microscopy experiments in unconventional superconductors and other type of strongly correlated electron systems at very low temperatures and high magnetic fields. She uses uh, tunnel microscopy and quantum oscillation techniques to provide direct inf information on electronic properties in normal and superductive phase. The title of her presentation is Anisotropic Superconductivity and Spin Vortex Antiferromagnetism in Nickel Doped Calcium Potassium Iron Arsenide. So, Isabel, please. So, good afternoon, everyone from Madrid. First, let me thank Pascual for the invitation and Julian for the introduction. So, today I'm going to discuss with you some uh, results that we have recently obtained in the nickel dope calcium potassium iron 4 arsenic 4. So, in this system, the superconductivity coexists with the spin vortex crystal magnetic order at low temperatures. So today I will discuss how the electronic properties in these materials are modified by this coexistence between superconductivity and this magnetic order. Uh, well, this material belongs to the family of the iron-based superconductors. So here I show you the crystalline structure of some subfamilies of these uh, materials. So all of them have in common the presence of this iron arsenic plane, which is very important to understand the superconducting and electronic properties in these materials. Well, uh, here is show you a schematic phase diagram of these compounds. So the parent compounds at low temperatures is antiferromagnetically, usually so in a spin density wave antiferromagnetic order. In this type of antiferromagnetic order, the spins are ordered ferromagnetically along one direction and antiferromagnetically along the perpendicular direction. 
So the parent compounds at low temperatures has also orthorhombic crystalline structure and, pre and presents a sort of electronic order, which is called nematic order using the analogy with liquid crystals. So as doping increases, these orders are suppressed and then superconductivity emerges with maximum critical temperature close to the point where this order goes to zero. And this is why it has been much discussed in this material, the possible influence of quantum criticality in the, in, on the emergence of the, the superconductivity. Then, well, unlike uh, what happened in the cuprates, in the iron-based superconductors, the electronic uh, properties, and in particular the superconducting properties, are much more diverse due to the multiband character of the Fermi surface. There are several bands uh, across the Fermi level, producing typically several uh, three hole pockets at the center of the Brillion zone and two electron pockets at the edge of the, of the Brillion zone. Several pairing symmetries have been proposed in these uh, materials most of them involving sign changing superconductivity. So today there is a big consensus that the most likely pairing symmetry is the S plus minus pairing. In this type of pairing, the superconducting gap is open over the whole Fermi surface, but it changes the sign between different pockets. Well, it has been also shown in these uh, materials that the electronic correlation can change quite a lot as a function of doping, and this can be nicely seen in this graph where we can see that the uh, mass enhancement changes by, by a factor of 10 as a function of the electron filling of the ion orbitals. Different uh, scenarios have been uh, proposed for the coexistence between superconductivity and magnetism, going from um, non-coexistent or phase separation to the microscopic coexistence with the presence of a quantum critical point and non-Fermi liquid behavior of the electronic properties of the optimally doped compositions. So let me now show you an example of one of these phase diagram that will appear later in the talk. This is the potassium dope barium one to two. So in this system, the whole doping suppress the, anti the spin density weight antiferromagnetic order in this material and then superconductivity analysis. The electronic structure and the pairing symmetry can also change quite a lot as a function of doping in these materials. And this can be also nicely shown in the previous example in the potassium dope, barium one to two. So in this material, London penetration depth measurements have shown that the, uh, in the underdope regime, in the region where superconductivity coexists with the magnetic order, the superconducting gap is very anisotropic. So then in the optimally doping, there is a fully open superconducting gap. And finally, the, the whole doping drives a Lipschitz transition where the electron pockets disappear at the overdope regime. And at this point, superconductivity becomes normal. Well, to get some insight into the electronic uh, and superconducting properties induced by into the changes in the electronic and superconducting properties induced by the proximity or the coexistence with a, a magnetic state, and we have studied this system, the nickel dope, calcium, potassium, iron 4, arsenic 4. This system is particularly interesting because the stoichiometric composition is placed at the optimal doping. And unlike other ion based superconductors, they are not a structural or magnetic transition accompanying the onset of the magnetic order. And therefore, this uh, material is an ideal system to investigate the interplay between superconductivity and antiferromagnetism in absence of any other order. So the first, uh, this material was first synthesized in form of single crystals by the group of Paul Canfield a few years ago. The stoichiometric compound has a critical temperature of 35 Kelvin, which is the highest among the stoichiometric ion base of the conductors. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, non-structural pneumatic transition has been found in this material. The crystalline structure of this 1144 compound is very similar to this in the 1 to 2 materials, but with alternating calcium and potassium planes. So this produces two inequivalent arsenic positions, the arsenic 1 and the arsenic 2, which, bre uh, which breaks the glide symmetry in the iron planes that is present in the 1 to 2 materials. And this is very important to understand the properties of this compound. So electron count and other experimental properties, such as London penetration depth, 
have some have uh, suggested that this uh, material can be considered analogous to the optimally potassium doped barium 122. If you remember, this is the system that I just showed you before. So then in this uh, phase diagram, the uh, stoichiometric 1144 compound will be placed here. So in this potassium barium 122, if you remember, the whole doping suppressed the antiferromagnetic order and then superconductivity emer emerges. So this analogy suggested that the magnetic order could be also induced in the 1144 compound by electron doping. So then it was proposed that the absence of the glide symmetry in this iron plane would favor a different type of antiferromagnetic order, a non-collinear antiferromagnetic order consistent with the Hedgehog spin vortex crystal where the spins on the iron sides are uh, oriented as shown here in this picture. This is different from the usual spin density wave antiferromagnetic order that appears in most iron-based superconductors. Well, the first realization of this uh, new Hedgehog spin vortex crystal antiferromagnetic order was achieved by the group of Paul Canfield a few years ago by electron doping the stoichiometric compound, substituting the iron by either cobalt or, or nickel. So this is the resulting phase diagram. Uh, for example, the nickel doping, as you can see here, suppressed superconductivity, and then this Hedgehog spin vortex crystal magnetic order appears. Well, for a 5% nickel concentration, this magnetic order coexists with superconductivity at low temperatures. So today in the talk, I will discuss results in two different compositions. In the stoichiometric composition, which is superconducting at low temperatures, and in the 5% nickel dope composition, where superconductivity coexists with this Hedgehog spin vortex crystal. So before uh, discussing the results, let me briefly introduce the experimental setup that we use. To make this measurement, we have used uh, low temperature scanning tunnel in microscopy. This technique is very useful to study superconductors because we can directly measure the superconducting density of a state to get some images of the vortex lattice and also to determine the electronic band structure using quasi-particle interference measurement, as I will show you in a moment. So in Madrid, we have several dilution refrigerator STMs that allow us to cool down below 100 millikelvin and apply magnetic field up to 22 Tesla. We can do a spectroscopic measurement with an area resolution below 15 microelectron volts. We also have the possibility in our STMs to prepare the tips and clip the sample in situ at low temperatures. Well, during the last few years, we have uh, set up a new low vibration laboratory for doing STM measurement of very high magnetic fields. So here you can see a picture and a an sketch of the, two of the 22 Tesla STM uh, laboratory. So it has a floating floor that consists of, uh, several, uh, of, uh, of several tens of tons of uh, concrete uh, of concrete suspended by springs and dampers with a resonant frequency of one hertz. So in this laboratory, the dilution refrigerator is suspended from the floating floor using this stainless steel structure. So we have optimized the laboratory to attenuate as much as possible the mechanical vibration. For instance, all the pumps needed to run the dilution refrigerator are placed in a different room and all the pumping line goes uh, go from the pumps to the cryostar passing through a huge box that contains more than a thousand of kilograms uh, of sand. Well, we have also determined the electronic temperature and general resolution of this new uh, STM for high field. For this, we have uh, made a spectroscopic measurement using superconducting tips of aluminum. We have obtained an electronic temperature of 85 millikelvin and an energy resolution of 8 microelectron volt. So we have also performed single atom point contact measurements of the quantum of conductance at 22 Tesla in several systems. And these measurements have shown that the electronic and mechanical uh, noise level does not increase when we operate, operate the STM at the highest magnetic field. So to further test this high field uh, STM, we have made a spectroscopic measurement in niobium disalenite, which can be considered a model superconductor for, for STM measurements. So in this material, we have made a spectroscopic measurement at atomic scale at high magnetic field. 
you can see here some of these measurements. These uh, images have, be, have been made at uh, 20 Tesla, where we can nicely uh, see the atomic and the charge modulation in this material, confirming the good performance of uh, the STN at high magnetic field. We have also performed measurement of the vortex lattice, obtaining high resolution images of the uh, vortex core states in this material. So now the, the, the high field STM microscope is fully operative, and we are using this setup to measure, uh, to measure different materials, uh, mainly iron based superconductors, but also other materials such as the bile semimetal, tungsten, detailurite. So in this material, we have seen the presence of Landau levels in the density of a state in region with uh, atomic resolution, being one of the few systems where these Landau levels has been observed in the density of a state of bile crystals. So let me now start with the discussion of the results. So I will first start with the stoichiometric compound, the calcium potassium iron 4 arsenic 4. So in this material, we cleave the sample in situ at low temperatures and obtain very large atomically flat surfaces as the ones up here. So London penetration depth uh, made by the group of Prosorov and STM measurement made in our group have shown that this material has a two cup superconductivity. So here you can see the superconducting density of states measured at low temperatures on different positions over the surface. So this density of state has a two gap structure, which is also observed in the, uh, in the distribution of the superconducting gap that has two clear peaks at three mini electron volt and eight mini electron volt with a relative weight that changes a bit as a function of the position. So RPS uh, data made by the group of uh, Kaninsky in this material have shown three hole pockets at the center of the Brion zone and two electron pockets at the edge of the Brion zone. They also have measured two, uh, uh, two different superconducting gaps on different uh, position over the uh, different pockets. Uh, and their value agrees well with those uh, obtained in, in STN and London penetration depth measurements. Well, in order to get information about the electronic band structure, we have performed a quasi-particle interference measurement. So this technique consists of imaging interference pattern produced by impurity scattering. And these interference patterns can be nicely observed in the conductor maps, as the ones in here, where we see these standard waves uh, characterized by a, by a wavelength that correspond to a scattering vector joining two points of the electronic structure of a, give, at a given energy. So this scattering vector can be directly measured in the Fourier transform of the conductor maps. And therefore, just by following the energy dependence of this vector, it's possible to get a measurement of the electronic band structure. So we have performed these QPI measurements in the stoichiometric compound, the calcium potassium iron 4 arsenic 4. So here I show you the topography of the region where we made this uh, study. An example of one conductor maps made simultaneously to the topography and the symmetrized Fourier transform. In this slide, I show you the energy dependence of this measurement. You can see several conductor maps as a function of the energy and the corresponding Fourier transform. So we have in this material, we have identified one single QPI vector that increases its size when we increase the energy. So when we compared our uh, results with RPS data, we find that the QPI vector correspond to a scattering vector between the middle and the outer hole pocket. So this vector decreases with energy and disappears when we reach the top of the middle band. We also have observed in this uh, compound that the uh, scattering signal disappears at energies close to the Fermi level, indicating the opening of the superconducting gap. This can be also observed when we plot the average conductance at this QPI vector as a function of energy, where we can clearly identify two energy scales that correspond to the two superconducting gap values in this material. Well, under magnetic field, we have uh, seen the vortex lattice. Here you can see some images from one Tesla up to a Tesla. The vortex lattice is disordered, but we can identify the hexagonal order at short scales. So we have also performed um, a detailed spectroscopic studies of the vortex core. Uh, we, have we have obtained that the vortices have a round shape, indicating that there is not uh, a, a significant in plane anisotropy in this material. 
We have also measured the presence of a slightly asymmetric localized state at the, at, the, at the center of the vortex core. So this has been previously observed in other iron-based superconductors and discussed in the context of the quantum limit. While in large scale, uh, uh, large scale images of the vortex lattice, so that the, the, the lattice is indeed very disordered. Here you can see the Delano triangulation of this image where we have count a large number of defects. So we call defects to those vortices with coordination number different from six. And in this material, we have found that the number of defects is nearly 50% of the total num number of vortices. So we have also calculated the positional correlation function and find that it decays exponentially with the distance, uh, indicating that the lattice has a short range order. So let me now show you the result that we have obtained in the 5% nickel dope compound, where superconductivity coexists with this vortex magnetic state. So in this material, we also cleave the sample in situ at low temperatures and obtain large atomically flat surfaces similar to those uh, that we find in the, in the stoichiometric compound. Well, however, the superconducting density of a state is uh, very different than in the pure compound. Here you can see the superconducting density of a state measured in this material at low temperatures. It uh, shows the presence of a very anisotropic superconducting gap and a large gap distribution with a maximum at 1.5 mil electron volt, which is a good estimate for the superconducting gap value in this material. So from the temperature dependence of the density of a state, we have obtained a superconducting gap versus temperature and a critical temperature of uh, around 8.5 uh, Kelvin, which is in agreement with macroscopic measurement and also with the value estimated for a superconducting gap of 1.5 mil electron volt. Well, to get information about electronic properties, we have also made quasi-particle interference measurement in this compound. So here is show you the topography of the region where we have made uh, this study. So in this uh, composition, there is more substitutional disorder and therefore we have uh, obtained a stronger QPI signal. So here is showing the conductor maps as a function of energy and the corresponding Fourier transform. So in this material, we have uh, found three QPI vectors that we named from smallest to largest, Q alpha, Q beta, and Q gamma. So then we have studied the energy dependence of this vector that can be shown, uh, can be seen here, where uh, we plot the Fourier amplitude versus energy for two different directions in the reciprocal space, the gamma m direction and the gamma x direction. So the maxima in this plot are the QPA vectors, and we identify three QPA vectors that decrease with energy following a whole light dispersion. We also can see in these plots that the scattering signal disappears at energies close to the Fermi level, also showing the opening of the superconducting gap. So three then minutes. we have... Yes? Yes, three minutes. Okay. So, okay, thank you. So then we have uh, compared our experiment with EFT calculation of the electronic band structure performed by the group of Rosel Valenti. So here I show you the Fermi surfaces for the stoichiometric compound and the 5% nickel dot compound, both in the paramagnetic state. So we find that the, whole, the inner hole pocket is slightly shrink and the outer electron pocket is slightly increased upon nickel doping, which is the expected result because we are doping with, with electrons. So although the overall structure of the Fermi surface remains uh, quite similar, so uh, we, we find in this, in this material very different scattering pattern. So if you remember in the stoichiometric compound, we found a single QPA vector with an electron-like dispersion, whereas in the 5% nickel dot compound, we have measured three different QPA vectors with a whole light dispersion. So then when we compared our QPA data with this calculation, we find that our QPA vectors are not consistent with this Fermi surface in the paramagnetic state. So as I will show you quickly in a moment, so we have found instead that our QPA vector are consistent with the Fermi surface reconstructed due to the presence of the antiferromagnetic order. 
So here I show you a schematic a representation of the Fermi surface reconstruction that occurs in this iron-based superconductor due to the presence of an antiferromagnetic order. Here you can see a sketch of the Fermi surface in the paramagnetic state, where the continuous line is the paramagnetic brillant zone, the dot line is the antiferromagnetic brillant zone, and this green arrow is the antiferromagnetic vector. So the magnetic order in this compound induces a folding of the banner structure along the antiferromagnetic vector due to the doubling of the unit cell in the magnetic state. So well, here I show you the calculation for the fold uh, banner structure and the fold uh, Fermi surface. And when we compared uh, our experiment with this uh, calculation, we can identify the three QPI vectors as a scattering vector between the hole and the electron pockets. So also we find in the DFT calculation that this vector decrease uh, with the energy as we also find in the experiment. So our QPI uh, results are in agreement with this Fermi surface, with this one structure uh, um, reconstructed due to the person of the antiferromagnetic order. So as I mentioned before, we uh, find that the scattering signal disappears at energies close to the Fermi level. And if we look at this in detail, here we plot the, the angular dependence of this scattering signal uh, for energy is close to the Fermi level, and we find that the gap has a fourfold uh, modulation that is not present in the stereometric compound, and that can be explained, uh, can be understood by the arrangement of the magnetic moment inside the unit cell, being the superconducting gap is smaller along the direction where there is non-zero magnetic moment. So this can be uh, better seen in this schematic representation of the top view of the crystalline structure, where the iron atoms are shown here in brown, they spin with these uh, arrows, and where the hyperfin field on the arsenic uh, uh, one position uh, 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 pointed uh, uh, outwards or downwards along the C-axis is represented, is shown here by these red circles with the, with the cross or a dot. So what we find is that the superconducting gap is larger along the gamma x direction, where the hyperfine field uh, on the arsenic one position cancel, whereas the superconducting gap is, is smaller along the, along the gamma n direction, where the hyperfine field on the arsenic one position remains finite. So this result is supporting a competing scenario between a superconductivity and the magnetic order. And therefore, in this material, we have found that this Hedgehog magnetic uh, order induces a Fermi surface reconstruction and a uh, fourth fall in plane anisotropy in the superconducting gap. Time is well, over. Yeah. Yes, I just finished with that. We have uh, observed a very disordered vortex lattice in this material. The number of defects is much larger, and the positional correlation decays faster, indicating that the lattice is more disordered in this material. So with this, I just uh, conclude. So in this uh, nickel dove compound, we have seen that the presence of the Hedgehog uh, vortex crystal magnetic order uh, produces a four fold in plane anisotropy in the superconducting gap, the reconstruction of the Fermi surface, and introduces disorder in the vortex lattice. And let me just acknowledge uh, all the people who have participated in this uh, work. The experiment has been made in the low temperature laboratory by the PhD student Jose Benito, Anton Fente, and Victor Barrena, and the postdocs Edwin Herrera and Bilongu, in collaboration with Herman Suderov. The DFT calculation has been made by the group of Rosel Valenti, and we obtained a single crystal of this material thanks to the collaboration with Paul Canfield at Ames, with the group of Paul Canfield at Ames. So thank you very much for your attention. Well, thanks to you for this uh, nice. Uh and a clear speak. Uh, we can uh, open for questions. We have some, some minutes. Here, Kiss van der Beek, please. Yes, hello, thank you. Very nice uh, talk. So, um, have you tried to do uh, such scattering measurements in uh, uh, non-zero magnetic fields? Uh, because you have the vortices, inside the vortex you have the normal state, and so in principle you can have uh, uh, quasi-particle uh, interferences at, at other energies uh, uh, of the particles which are in the, in the normal vortex course. Have you attempted any such uh, measurement? No, we have not tried yet, but we would like to try. So all the measurement, all the QPI measurement have, uh, have been made at zero field. 
So now we would like to study how the banner structure uh, changes as a function of field because there are some recent uh, theoretical proposal that there can be a, a change in the in the in the in the banner structure induced by the magnetic field in this material. So this is something that we would like to to try. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there any other question? Uh, please, uh, Tim or King. Okay, go I, ahead. I, I have a question. So you compare your QPI with the DFT calculation. So big size is not the DFT overestimate the size of the thermal surface. So you have for non-doped compound the RFS data from Kaminsky group and this calculation from Rosa Valenti. So how, how big this effect? And then if you compare your doped one with a calculation, then it's also kind of not a really direct comparison because if your band is reconstructed and on top of the, this uh, reducing of the size of the thermal surface, it's really hard to point which vector this corresponds to your QPI schedule. Any comment on this? Yes, okay. In our case, the, the, we can fit the, the, QPI, the QPI data with RPS data in the stoichiometric compound and also with the calculation. And in the, in the case of the nickel dope compound, uh, I mean, we see a small scattering vectors that cannot uh, be uh, uh, fitted in the, in the calculation for the, for the nickel dope compound in the paramagnetic state, but they fit quite well in the case of the reconstructed thermal surface. So we find a good agreement between experiment and calculation in these materials. Again, just to, to reiterate, so on your, you, you, you're telling that on non-doped compound, your DFT calculation fits with the arcs. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there's a, a hand from uh, Kampi, please. Yes, I just wanted to comment on the last discussion. Um, Arpez was not successful in getting good cleaves or measurements on the doped material. So I would sort of flip this around. It's one of the lovely cases where the complementarity of STM allows us insight uh, uh, that we couldn't get with ARPES due to cleavage issues. The other point I wanted to say experimentally is the fact that STM can look so far above the Fermi level is really wonderful. So I, I, I'm, I'm actually impressed with the agreement where it exists and the fact that the QPI of ARPES extends us into, uh, the QPI of STM extends us into regions ARPES doesn't let us go. Do you have some comment, Isabel? No, I fully agree with, uh, with Paul's okay. comment. There are any other question? I, I perhaps can, can make a, a general question. Is uh, uh, we talk a lot of, about the coexistence of magnetism and superconductivity, and one can imagine that the the volume of the, the room of the, the system is shared eh, in, in these two components, or there is an isotropy. One in one direction is some behavior, and then the other in another direction. Or, for example, uh, you know, the one band is uh, behaving in, in certain properties and the other. Do you have a general a criterion or, or do you visualize the possibilities of this coexistence in different ways? So in this material, different measurements, um, NMR, uh, most power, neutron scattering have shown that the, there is microscopic system between both phenomena. And they also have, uh, this measurement have also shown that the magnetic moment decrease uh, when uh, entering the superconducting state, which is indicating that the same electrons are responsible for both phenomena, superconductivity and antiferromagnetism. So the, the, these uh, two phenomena are, are produced by the same electrons. So the same electrons are, uh, are competing for, the, uh, for those phenomena. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, th thank you. So perhaps we can uh, 
finish here. Uh, here are the, let's say, um, we can transfer the, the, the talk to the second part with uh, yes. Janina Asano, yes. recovering her. <laughs> yeah, I'm connected to mobile, mobile data. Okay, so. Well, the... I don't know where. I don't know why you lose me. I was here. You have some, let's say, two slides or three slides. So we don't make any introduction and we go on. If you yeah. can just so resume just, your, your concept. Go I was on. just telling you, I, uh, I think I just told you the motivation. The motivation for this study was to uh, to present a method that was not that is non-invasive to discern whether the disorder in uh, in the host media where elastic objects are nucleated um, is point or correlated. And so we will use vortex matter in uh, high temperature superconductors as the toy model system to study this issue. Um, so. Uh, so we, uh, with bottom matter in type, in type two superconductors, I, am I sharing the screen? No, you're not. No, okay, ah, okay. Now? It's charging, now it's appearing, yes. Okay, so, uh, in the case of vortex matter nucleated in uh, type 2 superconductors, we can have point-like disorder, um, like naturally present defects in the, in the crystal structure. The material that we will study is uh, the, the paradigmatic compound bismuth 2212, it's a high TC material. Uh, we will study many samples, actually, all the results that I will show you here today come from 40 samples from different sample growers. Um, and so we will study these samples uh, that have a crystal structure that is presented here. And normally this, uh, this crystal structure presents some defects like vacancies or interstitials, and this will be point-like weak disorder. But we will also introduce disorder uh, via, via um, electron irradiation that will add extra point disorder. And we will produce correlated disorder in the sample by uh, irradiating with heavy ions that will make tracks of dislocations in the sample that will be uh, the columnar defects that will tend to pin vortices. If one makes uh, an image of how, how are distributed the columnar defects in the sample, one gets this image that is here, which has did an etching, a chemical etching of the surface of the sample. And as you can see, uh, these uh, darker points are the columnar defects and uh, they are distributed at random. And one can count the number of uh, columnar defects and one can define uh, the matching field, the DPI, that is equal to the number of defects per unit area times the flux quantum. And so at, uh, at the field equal to the matching field, uh, we have the same number of vortices than of uh, columnar defects. So um, we will study these samples. Uh, and what we will uh, use as experimental technique is the magnetic decoration technique. That is a technique that allows us to take snapshots of the vortex structures in extended regions of the sample. Actually, you can cover the whole sample. And then you can have a field of view uh, spanning between, uh, in our case, in all, in, in all our experiments, we will span between 5,000 and in some cases, 40,000 vortices. So we will have uh, information that has uh, a very, uh, it's a statistically representative of the, of the interaction force between these vortices. So this is a typical decoration image. Vortices here are uh, shown uh, like these uh, white dots. And uh, we take these pictures by cooling down the sample, uh, performing a field cooling experiment. And at low temperatures, we evaporate uh, ferromagnetic iron particles that due to the uh, field, local field gradient in day where the vortex core will get attracted towards the core of the vortices, the magnetic core of the vortices, and, and they will uh, decorate vortex positions. Uh, then we warm up the sample and we are able to see the vortex positions 
um, uh, with an SEM, with an scanning electron microscope. So we take pictures uh, of large fields of view of, of the vortex structure in, as I told you, several samples. And then what we do is uh, we digitalize vortex positions and then we get the position of vortices. And what we will consider here is the interaction force between vortices. That is a magnitude that can be written uh, like uh, shown here. Uh, in the case, this is, expression is valid in the case of uh, superconducting materials, type two superconductors with, uh, with large kappa values, but that is fine because visco is a, is a material with a large kappa value. And so uh, from magnetic decoration experiments, we will get the vortex positions. We will add up uh, over uh, all the vortex positions, the, the separation between vortex I and vortex J in the whole image. We will do this sum for every vortex on the, uh, computing the separation with the rest of the vortices in the structure. And there is also another magnitude that is very important here, that this, this lambda at of freezing, lambda the penetration depth, uh, the magnetic size of, of the vortex. And we get the value of this, of this magnitude to, to make this calculation uh, from local hole magnetometry measurements. Uh, actually, uh, what we do is, what, is that we measure the freezing temperature from local hole magnetometry experiments, and then uh, we use the value of lambda at zero temperature and relate them by the two fluid expression. So uh, normally what happens in a field cooling experiment is that uh, at a given temperature, at a given freezing temperature, uh, that is very close to the irreversibility temperature where pinning sets in, vortices uh, vortices are, are frozen in their positions at length scales of the lattice spacing. We continue cooling down to perform the magnetic decoration at 4.2 K, but at the length scale of the resolution of, the, of our experimental technique, uh, vortices will be frozen. It means that they can, they can still move, profiting from pinning, but they will move in a distance that is way smaller than lambda. It's a distance that is, that is cycle, coherence length. So it's uh, several orders of two or three orders of magnitude smaller than our experimental resolution that is lambda. So uh, the, the structure, that, the picture that we take at 4K is actually the picture of a structure that was frozen at, the, uh, at, at, at lattice space in length scales at a temperature that is the freezing temperature. So we estimate this freezing temperature from the uh, irreversibility temperature, it means the temperature at which uh, magnetic response becomes irreversible, and we do that through uh, local hole magnetometry measurements. Um, so we will compute for every vortex in the structure this interaction force with the rest of vortices in the structure. And we normally will get, okay, we will get images of the vortex structure. Uh, this is the case of uh, uh, this thin sample with point like disorder at, at the density of 30 Gauss. If we enlarge the field of view, we still uh, see a very nice hexagonal lattice with uh, quasi long range positional order and long range orientational order. And we overimpose here the Delaunay triangulation. There is an algorithm that allows us, us to uh, connect vortices with each neighbors. And as you can see, in this field of view, there are no defects. Then some dislocations will, will appear, but the, the, the structure is quite ordered. But in the case of samples with correlated disorder, this is the case of a sample with a DeFi of 30 Gauss. Uh, what we can, uh, at first view, we can say is that there are important uh, vortex uh, density fluctuations. As you can see here, there is a tendency to clustering in distributions of the images, and also the, the, the hexagonal order is, is lost. Right? So it's, uh, this structure is. Uh, so it has no uh, long range positional order. It has no, no long range orientational order. And uh, also there is a tendency to clustering in some regions. And uh, in a larger field of view, if one does again Delaunay triangulation, uh, one sees that there are a lot of defects. Actually it's more or less 50% of defects. Defects are, uh, are vortices that have a coordination different than six, it means that they have five or seven uh, first neighbors. And these uh, defects are shown here with red points. So that's an important difference between uh, the vortex structure 
in, in, in samples we point like and correlated disorder. Uh, but if one wants to uh, discern if uh, the sample has correlated or point disorder, some, some, uh, something like the density of the effects will not be a good quantity because one can have at very low fields, a very uh, in pristine samples at very low fields, one can have a large density of effects also. So we have uh, to look for another magnitude and, uh, and that was our, our idea in this work. And, uh, and that's why we looked at the interaction force. So normally what we do is the, we compute uh, the interaction force in these maps. This is for instance, a map of interaction force for vortices in a pristine sample, this one here in the top left. In the bottom left, we, we show the interaction force map, the zoom in of the interaction force map uh, for a sample with point-like disorder, extra point-like disorder uh, generated by electron irradiation. And as you can see, it, it's totally different to the case here in the top, uh, in the top right, where we see the, the interaction force map, map for a sample with columnar vapors. The sample of three five equal to thirty gauss that I showed you before. Here you can see there are places where patches where interaction force is larger. This uh, uh, this wine uh, vortices and um, patches where the interaction force is uh, smaller. So there is a tendency here to clustering that is evidenced by a larger local interaction force. So what we do then, one can do is, this is the modulus of the interaction force, but we also calculate maps of the components of the interaction force. And uh, okay, the modulus of the interaction force, here is a resume of all the samples and experiments that we perform. Here we have the results of 50 experiments performed in 40 different samples for uh, this range of fields, so magnetic decoration Unlike SDM, is a technique that, that allows to discern individual vortex positions at, at quite low fields, some up to 140 Gauss. For instance, here in this 212, it might be 200 Gauss, but it's not the range of fields of SDM that is uh, through Tesla. Uh, and so, uh, what, what we did is to compute the average, the mean value of the distribution of the of the of the of the of the interaction force of the modulus of interaction force and as we can see it increases with field and it, it is always larger uh, for the case of having correlated disorder in the sample those are the open points uh, then uh, using the, the mean value of the modulus of the interaction force does not seem neither a good way to uh, discern if disorder is correlated or point like because it, it is a quantitative difference between, there is a quantitative difference between this magnitude in, in samples with correlated and point disorder. So what we did was to look at, uh, at maps of the distribution of the components of the force. Uh, this is, uh, this is, these are maps of the modulus of the force, but we can do the same with the components. And then what we did was to calculate the probability density function of these uh, components of the force. And this is the main result of, of this talk. Uh, here I show you data in, the, in, in two systems with a point like disorder, pristine viscous samples and uh, viscous samples irradiated with electrons. And here data for uh, samples with correlated disorder with, for the samples with B5 of 30 Gauss. We have also data for samples with a V5 of 4,500 and 5,000 Gauss, uh, but, but the, the effect is similar. And this is, these are the probability uh, distribution uh, functions of, uh, of the uh, components of the interaction force. And as you can see, well, probably you cannot see because there is a lot of data here, but uh, uh, when you uh, start increasing the magnetic field, uh, your uh, distribution gets two values that are larger in the force because vortices uh, get closer. So it will give you a distribution that becomes larger. When you decrease the magnetic field, the distribution becomes narrower. And the same happens here in the in the electron dope, uh, in the electron irradiated uh, samples and in the, in the samples with columnar effects. But very interestingly, if one tries to uh, fit this distribution with the Gaussian distribution, one finds that it is, it is, it, the fit is really good 
for samples with point blank disorder, but it is really bad for samples with correlated disorder. Here in the insert, I'm showing you uh, these green points are the probability distribution of the force components in, in the, at the field of 18 Gauss. These are the, the points, the, the measured points in larger fields of view, having 20,000 vortices. Uh, and this line here is the Gaussian, uh, the, is the Gaussian fit to the data. And as you can see, the Gaussian distribution fits very well the data at very low interaction forces, but it fails fitting the data at high uh, for large uh, interaction forces. And this can be seen more clearly if we do some sort of a scaling of these distributions where we plot in the x in the horizontal axis uh, the, the force component divided by k1 and uh, and the interaction force the average interaction force at the at the magnetic field at which uh, one is uh, one is uh, measuring so this this will be k1 uh, as a function of a not time divided by lambda ab uh, and that divided by lambda ab to the uh, cube uh, so this is in this scaling is much more clear that for point like disorder all uh, distributions uh, get in a single curve, but for correlated disorder uh, uh, no, that is not possible. And also when one goes to smaller fields, these are the green data here and blue data here. Uh, first, at low forces, at low values of the force, all, all the curves collapse. But at large values of the force, uh, there is a, a spreading of the curves. And wh when one goes to um, smaller magnetic fields, this is even more evident that this cannot be fitted with the Gaussian uh, distribution. So this is what we call the non-Gaussian tails because the Gaussian distribution will uh, uh, will go will decrease uh, faster than these tails, and these uh, non-Gaussian tails. Uh, are a hallmark of uh, disorder in the media uh, being dominated, being correlated, the, the dominant disorder being correlated. Uh, so this is the most important result. And one can uh, have a look at data in a different way. This is again the same data, the probability density function, but now I am showing data uh, of uh, different samples at the fixed field. And also now I, I, uh, I'm, I'm putting here data at 8 Gauss and here at 68 Gauss. And uh, this corresponds to the pristine sample and this to the electron irradiated sample. And this is uh, draw in, in another scale. Now it's draw as a function of the component of the force squared. And as you can see, uh, data for, for, for samples with point like disorder, this black and blue, uh, points uh, decay as a, as a straight line uh, as, as it is expected for a Gaussian distribution because again this is plotted in a log linear scale but this linear scale is f to the squared. Uh, but in the case of samples with correlated disorder, this uh, violet, blue, orange and pink points here, it is rather clear that uh, this does not follow a, a linear decay. This will be uh, the linear decay uh, that uh, it, it can be, it can fit the data at small force values, but the, but the, the decay is slower for large fo force values. So these are the non Gaussian tails. And uh, if one uh, looks at the insert here, these uh, violet things here, the left insert, it is shown as a function of f squared. And as you can see, it does not decrease as, as a straight line. But if one plots the data as a function of f cubed, there is a, a, a straight, for the large value of the forces, there is a straight line decay of, of, the, of the distribution. So it seems that these non Gaussian, non -Gaussian tails um, decay as f cubed. And the same is observed if one changes the magnetic field that for, for point like disorder, one observes a strike decay in a log f squared uh, representation, and that is no longer the case for correlated disorder. So, two more minutes. Uh, two more minutes. Okay, I will go quickly. Mm -hmm. So, what we did afterwards, I will not go into the details because I don't have too much time, but we try to understand why 
the decay of this non Gaussian tails was as F uh, Q. So we did a, a, a theoretical model in which, con which we consider the, the probability distribution of the force between pairs. This is a different magnitude. Before we computed, the interaction force between the vortex and the rest of the vortices in the structure. But now we calculated the probability distribution of the interaction force between pair, pairs of vortices. We calculated that also in our data. But theoretically, one can write a nice expression for, for this magnitude that is related to the probability density of finding one vortex at the origin and another and at the position R uh, through, this, through this expression. And, and then, if one considers the general case of having an isotropic fluid-like system, a homogeneous system, like uh, in the case of what is a one has an homogeneous system, uh, this probability uh, can be written as a function of the uh, pair correlation function. Actually, it is two pi times the pair correlation function. This function here, g of r, that is written in the second term. This second term now uh, connects the probability distribution of the force interaction between pairs of vortices to the uh, pair correlation function. The pair correlation function of the system gives you the probability of finding uh, 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 the probability of finding a particle at a given distance or measures, if you want, uh, how evolves uh, uh, this as a function of, of distance. And uh, so with this expression, we now what we did is we consider the case of having a Poisson distribution of vortices. So if one gets the Poisson distribution of vortices, this G of R is a constant. And this uh, pair distrib this probability distribution of the force between pairs is what we see here in this stride by black line. So for a model Poisson distribution of vortices, one gets this value for the PDF of the pair force. And as you can see, this model, uh, toy model system uh, fits very well the evolution of the, of the experimental data for uh, samples with correlated disorder at large force values. Of course, at small force values, it deviates because as, as I show you, it follows the Gaussian distribution. And so this is rather interesting because uh, when one has the same density of vortices and of defects, the structure is, if you take a picture of the vortex structure and you digitalize vortex positions and you calculate the correlation, uh, the pair correlation function with G of R, it is different to the pair correlation function of the Poisson distribution. It is not constant, it goes to zero when you decrease uh, the, 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 the distance. Uh, but it's Time not over. so uh, it means that these non Gaussian tails that you see in the force distribution are coming from these regions where vortices tend to cluster and have kind of a Poisson like distribution. So, and I leave you with the conclusions uh, here written, and, and I leave the, the time for the questions. Okay, thank you, Janina, for the, the nice talk. So we'll open now the, the session for questions. In the, in the meantime, I, may I ask you, uh, uh, if you can, uh, you made the decoration at, for Kelvin, no? Uh, if you can make some decoration also a higher temperatures to see some evolution of, of the system with the temperature. Yeah, you possible? can. Yeah, it is, it is possible. Uh, I, I, but what you have there is there is a competition between the magnetic energy that is attracting the, uh, the magnetic particles that we use to decorate vortex positions and the thermal energy. So at, at sure. some point, the thermal energy will be larger than that, than that magnetic energy. And so I, I did some, there is other people that did this kind of experiments in Visco up to, mm. uh, up to 70 uh, 
help in more or less. Uh, that's uh, the work of uh, Bole. Uh, but I, I didn't do it as a function of, of temperature, but it, it's, it's possible. Okay. So as there I told you, these are 50 experiments in 40 different samples compressing each of them roughly 20,000 vortices. So it's a, it's a lot of okay. information, but, uh, uh, but the temperature close to the freezing temperature. We, we have a question from uh, Andrei Fedorenko, please. Yes. Andrei. Thank you. Is the distribution you measure to found uh, related to the distribution of a threshold forces at the depending transition? Sorry, so people can you, can you so, so this system, in, in principle, uh, should exhibit some kind of depending transition, and people compute it to uh, the distribution of the threshold forces for the depending transition, and we found some relation with extreme value statistics. Uh, I think uh, Alejandro he knows a lot about us. So, is it related somehow to this problem or not? It is related, and actually, uh, when you say the people, I one of the people that did that. I'm also author of like that paper. In that paper, what we did is to relate uh, the the mean value of the modulus of the interaction force with the pinning energy. So, in a in a static configuration, uh, the pinning energy uh, will be uh, balanced by this uh, interaction force. So the mean value of the distribution of the modulus of the interaction force, it's related to this uh, pinning energy, as you said. Uh, but here, and this is what I am plotting here, no? Uh, it's uh, the value of the, of the, the mean value of the modulus of the force as a function of pin. So it's related in that sense. But uh, then what we did was to study what happens with the components. Uh, okay. And we found because the components uh, of the force, uh, if uh, one has disorder at random and with disorder has to be Gaussian, as I show you here in the case of point disorder. Uh, but if if you if you analyze the distribution of the modulus of the force, since it comes from two components that are Gaussian, uh, the distribution will be a Rayleigh one. So it does not give you much information to study the distribution of the modulus of the force. It's more clear to see that there is some real event statistics uh, if you study the components of the force. But yeah, I, I didn't say it in the talk, but the fact that you observe this non-Gaussian tails is due to a real event statistics and these places in the sample where, where vortices try to cluster. So it is connected to that, yeah. Okay, thank you. And I have another question concerning your columnar disorder. Some time ago, people predicted the existence of a so-called transverse Meissner effect. So if you try to tilt your external magnetic field, your vortices will not fall immediately, like the pinning transition, but you should put turn up to some finite angle before it will start to, before your vortices will start to turn. So it's called uh, mm -hmm. the transverse Meissner effect. I think the first paper was by Leon Balins, but I'm not sure. So could you, could you observe such kind of uh, transition here? I didn't try. Uh, I tried another experiment. The technique, the experimental technique that we have to use to see that will not be magnetic decoration. Uh, we have some experiments doing that uh, with local coil magnetometry. So you will have to measure transmittivity as a function of the angle between uh, the columnar defects and the magnetic field. And yeah. you will have to see if uh, the deep scene transmittivity are at the angular location of, of the of the defects in the C-axis, that will be uh, one experiment, for instance. Uh, we have data on that, but uh, it's not it's not related to this work. It's in another work. Okay, thank you. Well, okay. Is there, is there any further question? Well, if it's not the case, uh, we can close this uh, double section of today. And we thank to the speakers for their effort, even <laughs> dealing with the connection. So thank you. And uh, now I give the, the Pascual to. So thank you very much, Yanina and Isabel, for the very nice talks and for accepting the invitation. Thank you very much, Sereni, for helping me co-chairing the section.
and uh, thank you all the audience to be here. And before we finish, I would kind would like to kindly ask for the audience to start their videos, so everybody could please start their videos. Yanina, could could you please stop sharing the screen, and then we can take a very nice picture of the audience. <laughs>